Taylor, welcome to the show, brother. Corey, thank you so much for having me today. Awesome. Uh, looking forward to talking and just kind of really uh, opening up uh, some some great discussion points today. But uh, Taylor, if you'll give me a, a good, uh, just uh, let everybody know about who you are and kind of give us a, your short story. Absolutely. So I'm a multifamily and self-storage real estate investor focused primarily on the Southeast. Our strategy, like others in the business today, is focused on real estate syndication, raising uh, passive investor capital to acquire value add commercial real estate investments in uh, targeted markets with experienced operators. Right. And so, and how much capital have you guys put together? Uh, our whole team's like a huge, enormous number. It wouldn't be, uh, it'd be, uh, it's north of a hundred million personally, right. uh, you know, I'm in the millions. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's, that's exciting. So we were talking earlier before we, we got started the show is about mistakes in multifamily, right? And like, particularly in raising capital, like with mistakes that people have raised in raising money. Can you share with that a little bit about what, what you've seen other people do that they probably shouldn't, shouldn't do that way? Yeah, absolutely. So there, there are so many mistakes that you can make in a multifamily investment. We're certainly not going to cover all of them uh, today. We're, we'll go through a, a few here. I think ultimately, you know, when we're talking about raising investor capital, you know, it's it's hard to it's difficult to even call this a mistake. But you know, we see pe- people doing things just generally dishonest business practices, whether it's pumping up the potential returns on an investment or just trying to get investors in a deal so they can get it across the line, but Ultimately, you know, you want your investors to be the right fit for your deal. You want your deal to be the right fit for your investors. You're only going to have more headaches on the back end if you, you know, bring the wrong people into your deal, whether it's just, you know, through good intentions, as they say, you want the right people in your deal. So that's number one. I say that's probably the biggest one. On the actual deal side, I think we're going to see this particular one pop up a lot more as 2023 goes on, but it comes down to not having the right financing for the business plan. There were so many folks that bought real estate, especially commercial real estate, when rates were the best they've been in history throughout COVID. Uh, But as everyone listening knows, They've been going up for a bit over the last year. We've seen a pause recently and may or may not go up or down in the near future, but probably for the rest of the year, they'll remain elevated. But plenty of folks didn't build their business plan based around a potential increase in interest rates and that those chickens may come home to roost uh, for some investors for the rest of this year or so is is what folks in the industry uh, generally expect. So having the right financing, having that aligned with your business plan and schedule absolutely critical especially in commercial real estate where you know you're not getting a 30 year loan your loan term is going to be significantly shorter than that and your interest rate is going to get refreshed and the bank's going to probably stay involved the whole time anyway right throughout throughout your whole deal throw another one out there that i've seen again as people have really dived into multifamily investing they've also gotten into brand new markets. And there's nothing wrong with investing in a brand new market, but we've had such a great market generally for the last number of years that people have kind of gotten away with doing not great deals in just growing markets and kind of riding that tide, if yeah. you will. Yeah, and the tide has, uh, is coming is coming out, right? <laughs> That's and right. A lot of people don't have shorts on, right? So the... They realize, you know, oh gosh. And I think you make a great point in the second part of the financing too. And I think every operator is going through that in their existing portfolio of some way, short or form. Not for every, like some of the stuff that you had that was fixed. But even for me, we've had, um, we have like four bridge refis going on this year. Uh, two of them next month and then two more uh, in October. And um we can't get out of those loans fast enough, but the only reason we're not getting them out of them now is because we have it's called the prepayment penalty, yes. right? And so the goal is to exit these. Now, the only way you can exit these types of deals truly is that you've got to have the financials to back the refi. And that's where a lot of people are getting screwed. They have ran on such thin margins that now that it's resetting, it still doesn't make really a lot of sense. 
And so that's where people have really gotten, there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of blood in the streets still coming and, or their loan is, their cap rate is gone. And now the loan requirements require them to have another cap rate. And to buy that new cap rate is priced out of oblivion. And that's going to stop. And that's actually going to be, that's coming shortly because people are in a lot of, a lot of them are in their cap rates, but they're starting to mature. And as that happens, there's going to be a lot more opportunity, I think as well. Would you say that as well? I totally agree with that. You know, even uh, diligent sponsors out there that are, you know, well, reasonably well positioned have had to pause distributions on many deals just to get ready to bank the capital so that they could buy another interest rate cap when there's eventually expires, you know, if they're kind of being defensive about it. So yep, yep. there are problems, if you will, all around, but if you, the resourceful thing to do is to turn that on its head mentally and look for the opportunities, obviously deal with the situation is, as best you can, right? but look for the opportunity. Yeah. So that's, and that's really, it survives. To, I've heard this uh, term. I love it. Survive to 25, right? So, <laughs> and, and all the existing stuff you have, you're like, I just need to survive. I need to make sure that I'm operating efficiently, getting all my stuff in order as best I can. Right. And then, but understanding Taylor, the opportunity, which is this now market, right? Because the fundamentals of real estate have not changed. We are still undersupplied in most markets. And so if that's the case, everything just went on sale, right? And you sure the rates are higher now, but they won't stay long that way forever. So if you can make something pencil in today's debt, right? I think tomorrow's debt is going to give you a, a nice little um, opportunity. Absolutely. And I think stepping back, the key is to understand that the future has never been known, right? So we look back and we think about what decisions that we made in 2019. We think, oh, I could have made such a better decision on XYZ because with the benefit of hindsight, we know what happened. So sure, with perfect foresight, we could make the best decision. But and I'm, I'm, I have a reason for saying this. There were people who got burned by the decrease in interest rates because they didn't understand their prepayment penalties. So if you that just gets to the purpose, the point of if you don't understand how your financing works, how the numbers work, then you can get burned in any direction. And that just That's boils down to know what you're doing. Know what you're doing, understand your business plan, right? And operate with that in mind, right? So as we're talking about mistakes, because I think this is really uh this is my favorite part to talk about is talking about the dirt because everybody has it and stories, right? So you were talking about, you had a story of managing property managers, right? And um, what that is like. Yeah. So there are a few things that we could talk about there. And I can tell you a story about, so the first deal that I passively invested in, I I started out as a Wall Street investor, like many of your listeners might be investing in stocks and bonds, but got frustrated with that and heard about this great thing, real estate, and wanted to get started. I started as a passive investor. First investment that I made was in some apartment complexes in uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, just outside of downtown Atlanta. And uh, and I've had the, this conversation with the relevant operator on my podcast, so I'm not airing any dirty laundry here that's not out <laughs> in public, right. but I will be vague with some details. Uh, but basically, uh, the property manager was kind of in a quasi third party situation. They weren't owned by the main operating general partner and they weren't a full third party. The owner of the property management company had general partner shares as part of his compensation or his incentive to perform in the deal, which in theory, as long as everyone is a good actor, and that is a big caveat, that can work out great, again, in theory. What happened in practice is that the gentleman who ran the property management company essentially concluded that he couldn't be fired and he could be paid in whatever way that he wanted. So uh, long story short, took money, you know, more than he was entitled to essentially. So essentially, in my opinion, stole some funds from us that led to a protracted multi-year legal battle arbitration. And he actually, the this guy actually died um, in unfortunate circumstances uh, 
through his own actions throughout that legal battle. And, you know, it was just a whole mess. And we still made money on the deal when we got out, not as much as we expected. But really, the lesson there is that you need to be able to fire your property managers. If they're going to be a third party, you need to be able to get rid of them. If you are in a situation where, say, you're passively investing in a deal or you're an operator that owns your property management company, then I think that's great. You know, we've done many of those deals. If you have an individual that's misbehaving, then you can fire them in that situation. But when they own general partnership shares, it just turns into lawsuits and arbitrations and everything. Totally agree. Uh, totally big agree. Mess. Right. It's never it's never equally yoked. Now, now there's a difference between ver being vertically integrated. So that's something that a whole different deal. But third parties, third party. Yep. Um, we just this year went vertically in, vertically integrated for our portfolio. And then we'll probably say it's the best thing since sliced bread, even though I said I would never do it. I said I would <laughs> never, never, never do it. And here I am eating crow because I did it. And I'm thinking it might be the best move I made 2023, right? Because I needed to tighten the belt and I needed to make sure and ensure that our properties are running efficiently. And most third parties, they're all fee-based. And when you're fee-based, there's not always as much yoke, even though you, you know, we hold them accountable through asset management. But there's always that. And there's like, you know, the things that no one ever sees. Like, oh, they're not going to see this $300 whatever right and and you get that all the time par for the course but also here's the other part is people will steal from you right mm -hmm. and so you've got a wonderful story of i think catching someone stealing well that was that that was that story that's the okay. one where, where he oh, was that caught. was that was it uh, yeah 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 so and i've seen that uh, same or very similar situation happen to other operators in the business who, instead of general partnership shares, gave the property manager uh, limited partner shares right. to, again, give them an incentive to perform in the deal, which again, as long as everybody is a good actor, then that's not a bad idea, yeah. right? That's a very yep. sound idea. But yep. when you have bad actors, then that just muddies the waters so much. And, you know, you don't hear about the good actor situations, but- right. You know, I don't want to air anybody else's, you know, stories or anything, but we've I've just seen it happen to so many folks where um, just that that kind of quasi third party blows up and having that vertical integration, I think, is a, a great idea. It's very well proven out, helps with asset management, helps the little things not get swept under the rug so much. And yeah. you're right. When you hire a third party property manager, no matter how great they are and they can all be very great there might be a little thing in their mind where I could just go find another client if this doesn't work out, which, you know, right. Take that as you will, but there is an advantage to having that vertical integration for sure. No, I agree as well. So I was thinking about it. So I, I've got so many stories where we've caught, you know, just the property managers themselves, right. Stealing. Right. So theft is a big deal and you try to limit it as much as you can, but I'm like, we try, we don't take money orders. We don't take, you know, it's like, you've got to go onto our portal to pay, but occasionally you do take a money order. Right. And, um, man, that's happened. We caught a girl eight months pregnant. Right. And we come in and we're like, what's up with this money order? And she's like, Oh, what do you mean? What do you mean? And then she goes and she starts, she finds it in a system. And she didn't realize that when you put it in, it scans it correctly and then she comes with another and she's made different, you know, like, oh, it was signed over. And I was like, well, that's not what was in the system. And uh, and then you have to admit it. So then we have to let this girl woman go, right? Eight months pregnant, by the way. And what do you do? Like, so when we let an eight-month pregnant woman go, and this is all through, this is through a third-party management, but it was a big deal HR-wise, right? Like, what, you know, what's our ramification? Like, this is black and white, have to. Of course, all the staff, we can't tell them why we let her go. And they're like, you just fired her. And so, like, our whole staff quits. Ugh. And it was just like, gosh, dang it. you kidding me? And you want to be able to tell them, like, dude, but you can't. And um, those are just, like, the nightmares that you have of something so stupid. And you're like, why would you ever do this, right? Why would you... Especially you're going to have a baby. You're getting ready to go take off, have time off. We're going to give you that time off. And $375 or $575 
is going to do, do change your life now. Like you're, you'll find a job and good. Did luck. you press charges? I mean, that is you could. I, we didn't. I I could have, but I didn't. Right. Um, That's a tough decision. It was a tough one, man, because I wanted to. I was so mad. I was so angry, right? Because I like this person, and uh, but that's 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 part of what it is, right? That's probably federal charges too. I would I would wager. I don't know, but yeah, big deal. Check fraud. Yeah, you know, it's just like, what are we doing here? Um, but again, the business is pretty good when you look at it as a whole. And so, Taylor, give me your perspective on why do you love? Uh, you know, apartments in, in the multifamily space. Oh man. And, so, well, and, well that, yeah. and I'll say that and self storage too, because I know you guys are heavily in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I do uh, invest in both apartments and, and self storage. So we can start with apartments. So you mentioned quite a bit earlier on in our conversation about how the nation, most markets are undersupplied. So I think Investing in something that's scarce can put yourself in a great position to earn a strong return. Of course, there's more to the story than just buying something that's you know scarce. We need to manage it well and everything. But you know, fundamentally, to me, again, I started uh, in the real estate space because I was a Wall Street type of investor and got frustrated by the constant up and downs. The almost total lack of cash flow, even when you compare a typical dividend issuing stock to what we expect to make on most, what most real estate investors expect to make in terms of cash flow on their deals. I'm not giving a specific number. Just say, if you did what most stocks do in their dividend, you'd be pretty disappointed is you know, my perspective on that. Right. But when I was really heavily focused on Wall Street investing, I felt like I was blindfolded and taking steps forward, and I didn't know if the next step was going to be a step up or a step off a cliff. And that just really just fundamentally bothered me. And I started learning about what was out there in real estate investing. I met so many flippers. This is many years ago now. Many flippers who some of them were doing quite well, but many of them were kind of struggling to scale and they were getting frustrated. It was just turning into another job. The tax rates are very high for flipping as well. Single family investors, again, some had done pretty well in that, but for them, it was it tended to be a job. And I just saw over and over again how the scale of larger properties, apartments had a just better ability, a better potential, if you will, to generate both wealth and cash flow without the hassle of single families or you know these other smaller deals that are out there and you know as you know now owning your property management company but if you even hire a third party property management company you even if it's not perfect you get a lot more out of them when you have 200 units instead of two units right you get a lot more attention you get full time staff yeah, you have to asset manage them and make sure they're doing their roles and you know all of that that's involved, but it's just not the same as one or two doors that it's entirely different, yeah. right? It's yeah. it's like fundamentally like night and day. Right. And I think our there's you know, we could go on and on, but our ability to in the commercial space, since apartments are commercial real estate to add value and force appreciation by improving operations and raising rents and all those other things. Technically, you can cut expenses. I think looking at cutting expenses too much is kind of looking in the wrong direction. You you know, things cost what they cost. You you know, you can get some of that, but focus on improving operations and and raising the bigger chunks on the on the growth side, not on the yes. uh, trimming it out. Yes. Right. And there are some opportunities there. You know, if somebody's paying too much for snow plowing or whatever, you know, you get that kind of one off hit, but more potential on the upside than raising incomes. But those are many of the things that I, you know, like about apartments is I just see that long term, I think they have the best potential to generate wealth and cash flow, real estate being immensely tax advantaged compared to any other investment you can yeah. really look at. And I just, I love the tangibility of it. And, you know, generally when you talk about tangible investments, you might get some gold bugs and silver bugs that show up and, you know, they can have their thing. But to me, the tangibility of real estate plus the income stream is what really makes 
real estate valuable and apartments give us that scale to continue to grow and generate wealth. Whereas if we're talking about say precious metals, we're kind of a bit speculating about the future value. We have no ability to control, you know, and that's fine, but I just think better potential in real estate and apartments. Yeah. I think that's a big piece of it, Taylor. It is the control piece, right? It really is about understanding the levers and that you can manipulate like what I love about the apartment side or just even the commercial side is it's all based on numbers and the numbers don't lie and the numbers are the numbers, right? So you can, and then the question is how can you affect the numbers? Can you put in capital improvements? Can you uh, improve the property? So then you generate more income, which affects the numbers. It's really about affecting the NOI and your ability to do that over as an operator that I think is is a fun game to play. And it seems to make sense where, like you said earlier, when you're in the stock market and you're making plays and moves, you don't know if the next move is the one off the cliff. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then when you looked about like, you know, the blue chips or when you invest and you get the way wall street thinks about what a dividend is, you're like, dude, I couldn't pay off my car payment with that dividend. I'd have to buy so much of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Where traditionally real estate um, and apartments or storage can pay off such a higher value return over a period of time that's way more cash flow, right? And just it just spits off bigger checks as the I think with the potential to spit off bigger checks, which makes it way more pliable. And that works into the investment strategy of uh, so many people out there. That and I think more people would do it if they understood it better. I agree. And we've seen, there have been many changes in the real estate space generally with uh, the Jobs Act in, what was it, 2012 that really opened up the syndication space and, you know, has enabled a lot of the growth that we've seen. And, you know, podcasts like we're talking on today, helping share knowledge. I mean, heck, I started learning about real estate through podcasts and then, you know, grew from from there. But it's really the information uh, revolution. Now, to go back to, you know, what you said about real estate all being numbers, a hundred percent true, but this is where, you know, we don't want to get too far away from the fact that you and many others, myself, we have experience to add wisdom to those numbers because anybody can look at a pro forma or underwrite a property and just say, yeah, we're going to renovate all 200 of these units in probably the first two or three months and raise all the rents and, you know, we're going to kill it. But there's, that's a kind of a ridiculous example, it's but way more of an art, right? It's an art. Exactly. Form. You have to understand how the correct sequence to do it and how, and how much to do it. Right. How many people, exactly. do you know, Taylor put way too much money in all the wrong things and they're wondering why they don't get the red bumps. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I think that's where, you know, we saw that deal that, um, blew up in Houston earlier this year. Now, I don't have any inside information on that. I just see what I read in the news and yeah. that's all I know. But the sponsorship team, to my understanding there, was not as experienced as many of the others out there and you know, maybe made the wrong move in terms of their financing, where their interest rate caps were. And you know, if, if you read some news articles about the operations of that deal, there are some not great things that the tenants were kind of saying publicly about what was going on. So that's really where the, you know, the R, the people aspect of owning real estate comes in, because at the end of the day, if we don't treat our tenants well, then it doesn't matter that the property up the street is getting $300 more a month. Our tenants are going to leave and move yeah. down and pay more down It there. doesn't mean that you're going to get it. <laughs> that's it right. doesn't mean that you're going to get it. So it really is an art and the ones that can bend it, right? As a, like, I mean, I think that's the beauty of this this business is for the people that understand how to create wealth and how to add value to properties. There's so much opportunity out there, right? There's there's always going to be a property that needs uh, someone to understand what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and you can increase value by doing it correctly. Absolutely, and that's the space uh, that we live in. Yes. To give another example, one of the deals we did a while ago, uh, there was, we talked about not cutting expenses, but one of the examples I kind of mentioned snow plowing, but the old owners lived overseas. I won't say exactly where, but somewhere that it doesn't snow basically. And the property that we were buying or the properties that we were buying are in an area where it snows quite a lot, but the owner's being overseas, not really knowing what it costs for snow plowing and everything, we're hugely overpaying 
for a snow plowing. So that was kind of an instant way to cut expenses and add value. Now, you don't want to cut expenses to the bone, but by being present, understanding the market and, you know, really digging in, you can look for those ways to add value. And it's just one so funny that. you talk about snow plowing because that we we had a property where we were like, what in the world happened? And we're like, is she every time there's like two inches of snow? Are we are we plowing this thing or what's going on? <laughs> Like, hold on, <laughs> just because there's a couple inches of snow doesn't mean we we go into town and, uh, you know, like, let's let's understand what we're doing here. And but it's the little things like that you can catch like, oh, if someone doesn't know, they think that's just standard. Right. And all of a sudden they look at it like, oh, gosh, well, and the uh, snowplow company is never going to tell you we're not coming. No, of course. Right? not. <laughs> so, <laughs> They'll take your money. <laughs> They'll take your money. So uh, as we kind of move along and kind of close it up, uh, what would you? What's your biggest takeaways? Uh, things that you, when it comes to you, guys have raised a lot of money, right? So what would you say? The what are the best things that you've done right in in your guys's raising capital sector? Like, what do you guys think you are doing really well in that space to attract capital? It's a good question. So for me, where I've had the most success, and this is looking back at where we're getting the most wins, if you will, is putting ourselves out there, putting knowledge out there and sharing and just saying, essentially opening it up. Hey, if you want to talk with me, here's where to reach out and get in touch. Like for me, no, but like I just did an interview on my show about this, but at the end of the day, everything in our lives is sales. As I stand here, I got married about two and a half months ago. I had to sell my wife on marrying me. Now, if I told her that I, you know, I closed her and got her to marry me, then she might not find that too appealing, but it's a fact, you know, at the end of the day, we're always selling no matter what. So in my business and, and my real estate investing, we don't close, right? It's just putting it out there and the people that are interested come our way and it's effective. It works. And it's also, I build my business to the best of my ability to how, how can I sleep at night, right? What, what can I do that we can make money, but also I can feel good about it and sleep at night. And if I had to constantly like, you know, really hammer people and say, Hey, you know, invest in this deal, blah, 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 and try to close them out. I just, I, I wouldn't like that at all. And, you know, it could be a compliance headache. So putting the information out there, putting the knowledge out there, building connections and finding the people who resonate with what we do, what we have to say, and the types of, you know, deals that we offer is really an effective way to raise capital. It's frankly, it, it can be difficult to scale though, because um, individually we are all finite goods. Like I can only be in one place at a time. So the goal is to look at ways to optimize and maximize that reach to find the people who are most receptive to the message, the business, you know, and what we do. Amen to that. I think that's a big piece of it too. That's something that we're uh, working on this year as well is uh, making sure that I'm not the head of everything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause uh, then you have a job. Right. And the and the goal is uh, but you, but you are right, though. The job is to is we are in marketing. Right. Mm -hmm. And the more you get out your message, you got to share the story because you don't know who it's going to hit, who's going to hit on. And they're like, dude, that makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I think that's a, a big piece of it. Right. Get it out there and, and, and have a podcast. I love that. You know, part of the reason I have a podcast is I have a platform. Mm -hmm. Right. And to get out to as many people and touch as many people and to create value. Right. Creating value is really what it's all about. Right. And as we uh, we jump in, any any books that you've been reading lately that you feel like I uh, see you got a lot of books behind you or at least on your screen share. What books have you read lately that's really that you really enjoyed? Yeah, these are physical copies behind me. Oh. I can prove it to you. I'll pick oh. that up. There you no, go. They're, they're real. I might fall down. But no, there are real books behind me right now. I'm in the middle of a book that's been recommended to me probably by more people than any other, more guests on my podcast, so successful real estate investors. And that book is Who Not How. Listening to the audio book, I don't have a physical copy quite yet, but I'll probably get one at some point. But that is all based around if you have a problem in your business that you need to solve, rather than asking how to solve it, you need to ask 
who can help me solve this problem? And the book is peppered through with examples of people, whether it's uh, business owners, investors, sports figures, or you know whoever who solved the problem that they needed to solve by asking a better question, which is instead of how, they asked who. And for me, that has, in hindsight, looking back at strides that I've made in my business, that's been pretty much every stride that I've made in my business turned out that I somewhat unknowingly at the time asked the question, who got a, who put them in place, you know, got them all, you know, whatever it is, got them all set up, got them integrated into the business and then was able to go further for that. So now that, you know, going through this book, seeing it's been so much more effective for many others, I'm more deliberately, and I have a, a several whiteboards over here, but I'm more deliberately asking who can help me solve X, Y, Z problem. And I wrote down a problem that I have, who can help me blank, you know, and I'm just intentionally doing that more and more. And I can really, uh, again, in hindsight, that was effective for me, but now that I think I'm focusing on that more. I just see so much potential. Yes. Right. And it's this potential that's working without you, right? Like, like that doesn't require your input as much. And I think that's what we're all striving as entrepreneurs and business owners. How do I truly, when you have a real business is when the business runs without you. And so building those people, those, the who is really saying, how do I build my tribe in a way that uh, creates it where I'm at? I'm putting out, I do the things that I want to do that I'm really, the, that's my best time served and not trying to figure out how to do something just because I, you know, I can. And that's a big, that's a big step. It's a huge step. So when you make those uh, changes your life and I, I see it's changing yours and, and mine as well. Right. I feel like that is a, that's a great book, by the way. And, um, and I think I need to re-listen to it as well. <laughs> it, you know, cause it, it, sometimes, you know, you listen to it the first run, you're like, Oh, that's good. When you listen to it the second time, it really, I've, my a book I've been reading, right. Attraction. I've read it like three times. I almost read that book every year just because it gets me back on track of like making sure I have the right people in the right seats, um, doing the right work and just asking myself, is my business running efficiently? Right. And that's something we've been, we ask ourselves a lot is, are we efficient? Are we an effective team? Right. Or are we, are we in the wrong seats somewhere? And uh, the more that I get that out and get, we put it out there. It seems to be that we're smoother company. So, uh, Taylor, uh, if you could give any advice to uh, some of the new people that are listening right now, what would you tell them? Commit. Committing to achieving your goal and to taking the actions that are required. It's almost certainly going to take you longer than it would like you to. Uh, You're going to have stumbling blocks. You're going to have points where you don't know what to do or you're afraid of taking a particular action or something's not happening in the way that you want it to. And the key is to just continually push through those things. And just another example from who, not how just popped into my mind uh, as you were, you were speaking is one of the lessons that I just recently came to on the book was about procrastination. Now I'm not a big procrastinator, but I am also definitely not a perfect person. I've been known to do that or put tasks off that I don't know how to do But procrastination, the lesson is that procrastination is a sign that we need to find a who to help us with the thing that we're procrastinating on. So if you want to get into the business and you're procrastinating on making broker calls, maybe it's a sign you need a who to handle that for you or reshape your business in in such a way. But um, yeah, just keep pushing forward and, you know, you'll be surprised what you can achieve. Amen. Amen to that. And if people are looking to get a hold of you, how do they how do they get a hold of you? Sure. So um, yeah, my website, just go to investwithtaylor.com if you want to talk about uh potentially investing, the show, my my show, the passive wealth strategy show. Uh, or you can email me, Taylor at ntecapitalgroup.com. Awesome, awesome. We'll make sure we put that in the show show notes. Taylor, I want to thank you for taking the time to come onto this uh, podcast and and sharing some of your wisdom, your knowledge. Guys, I'll tell you, like, your power of your mind is everything. You really do not understand. And commit that whole word. Commit. What my life was sucked until I made a commitment to do real <laughs> estate. Right? I was not living the life, and but I it took an actual commitment. 
And um, those things right there, that, that word is so powerful. And if you'll just listen to Taylor, what he said, and, and, and really inspire you to take action don't and be fearless, right? When you do that, success will come find you guys. Listen, uh, if you believe it, you can achieve it. And your paradise is possible.